Hello! Welcome to the Week 2 Lecture, Exploration, Expansion, and Faith. This is Dr. Rebecca Wood, your instructor. I have some suggestions for reading historic literature. You want to be on the lookout for non-standard grammar and spelling. You may find some of the spelling shocking. In fact, I did. I, w I had one word last week that I uh, had to look at forward, sideways, and then look at the context and figure out what it meant. And suddenly I was like, oh, that's what it is. And so also we're going to be searching for the narrative in fragments. So we have small pieces of literature or documents and we're trying to figure out exactly what was going on. Uh, one thing that also can get in the way is that past language and customs could be very surprising, shocking, or even unattractive today. Uh, you may have noticed some of the ways that our writers have um, referred to the peop to the Native American people and other people um, in our reading passages. Also, St. Louis can be a poetic place, and that's one reason I wanted to put in Angus Umfraville's poetry this week, because there are plenty of poets in the city of St. Louis, and it's a very, um, very inspirational city. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how it all fits into that, but happy people are less likely to write poetry, or maybe people are less likely to write poetry when they're happy. When you're happy, you're out in the sun, you're playing baseball, um, but when you're not so happy, maybe you're at home writing a poem about why you're not so happy. Um, and then what are the most likely subjects of poetry? Love, death, romance? Um, and one last thing, try reading challenging works out loud. If you find that, well, maybe uh, the Lewis and Clark Expedition journals are not doing a whole lot for you if you're reading them silently, try reading them out loud. Um, one time I took a class in Geoffrey Chaucer's work, and the professor suggested that we read the work out loud with a German accent, which sounds really funny, but it helped. So read the challenging works out loud. I think you can leave out the fake German accent. This is a picture or a map of a very big real estate deal. This was the Louisiana Purchase, which we've all heard of, but for some reason it was really hard for me to picture just how enormous the real estate deal was. So I found this map and I think it shows just um, how tremendous that um, expansion of our country was and how much territory Lewis and Clark were expected to cover. In fact, the Lewis and Clark expedition took two years, and um, considering all the all the real estate, all the territory that they covered, two years really is not as much time as we might imagine. And during that two-year trip, they were sent to explore the geography, check out the plants and animals, and get to know the people, and maybe just flex their their muscles a little bit and show the people how strong the United States was because they were setting the stage for expansion. And here's a couple of really nice images of the Lewis and Clark expedition as we might imagine them now. Also this week we're going to talk about religious influences. In fact, we started talking about them last week with Father Jacques Marquette and his um, reading or his writing that we looked at last week. And then there's been a Jesuit influence throughout St. Louis, including our own St. Louis University, which is celebrating its bicentennial this year. So this is a really good year to talk about the religious influence on the history of St. Louis. And also this week we have readings from St. Rose Philippine Duchenne, and she arrived in the United States actually 200 years ago this year as well. And she established schools including in St. Charles and Florissant. And there's a school named for her, the Villa Duchenne School in St. Louis as well. And she had many challenges and struggles of life in the new land. And so here's some more images of faith as the foundation of St. Louis. I couldn't possibly get all the images in of all the beautiful churches and other buildings in St. Louis that have religious influence, but I do have a nice image here of the old cathedral. And I will note that all the images I use in my PowerPoints, I do try to have a, um, an, an attribution of where I got them so that I'm not 
just stealing them off the web. And then if I don't have an attribution, this picture here is a picture that I took. And so that does not have a cap, a little um, credit uh, caption on it. And this is the Cathedral Basilica of St. Louis. Uh, the Cathedral Basilica of St. Louis has a tremendous collection of mosaics, many of them all over the ceilings and walls, and there's even a mu mosaics museum there. Uh, so if you have some time and you would like to see some of the beautiful buildings in St. Louis, these are two that you could put on your list. Also, St. Louis University has um, tremendous Jesuit history, and here's one of our fabulous buildings, the Bishop de Burg Hall, and I put Bishop in um, parentheses because it's actually just called de Burg Hall, and it's a beautiful building. It has fabulous wood floors and and staircases, and it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful building. And also, St. Francis Xavier College Church, and that's a gorgeous building, and it's right on the corner, and uh, you may have driven past it, and um, it's definitely worth um, finding a parking place and going in and seeing the building if you can. Also, this week we're going to be talking about Angus Umfraville, who was the author of the first public, published book of poetry west of the Mississippi River. He was, uh, at one point before he wrote this book, he was commissioned to write a poem about the siege of Baltimore, uh, which inspired Francis Scott Key to write the national anthem. And then, uh, Fra uh, pardon me, Angus Umfraville was only 23 years old when he came to St. Louis and published his book. And then afterwards he went and went somewhere else. So he was just passing through. But while he was here, he published the first book of poetry west of the Mississippi River. And as we are looking at Angus Umfraville's poetry, here are some tips. When you're reading poetry, scan it first. Just take a look at it. Is it really long? Are you going to need to get a cold beverage to read through it? Or is it something that you can um, read in less time and with less effort? Uh, read the poem once silently. I like to read the first time kind of fast just to get a feel for it. And then read it slowly out loud after that. Take notes as you read it again. Look up words with which you are unfamiliar. Read the poem at least once more. And I know you're thinking, oh my goodness, how many times do I have to read this? If you find the poems a little easier to understand or if you can't stand it anymore, um, just read it several times. Um, think about what's the poem's theme or main idea. Some of us, when we read poetry, if we spent years and years studying literature, we might pick one little word and try to say, well, what could that mean? Could it mean one, one or two things? Um, is it kind of a naughty meaning? Uh, sometimes you can analyze poems uh, to the point of, of being a little bit silly, but um, those of us who have been um, studying literature for a long time uh, can have a lot of fun doing that. So feel free to see if you can find some hidden meanings or have a little fun with the literature and poetry. And as we are wrapping up this week's lecture, I have some suggestions or reminders about Paper 1. Uh, paper 1 is due on April 7th. I did not have any papers due on Easter week, so I did that on purpose. That's your Easter present, and it's an Easter present to me as well. And paper one, um, all this information is from the, the um, assignment on the left. So uh, the paper needs to be four to five full pages of text. It should be documented in MLA format. And um, if you go to the assignment sheet for paper one you will have links on there that you can click on also I'm going to post the file for this lecture so you can look at it at your own pace and those links should work for you and paper one should be about early St. Louis history and so what I want you to do is to uh, use a selection of primary texts and write a formal essay describing the history of pre-Civil War St. Louis. Obviously you can't fit everything into four to five pages, but I am looking forward to seeing what you have to say about early St. Louis history based on the text we've studied so far and other things you may have learned about the city. Just please re re remember to document anything that you find in your research. And I hope you have a great week and I'm looking forward to reading all of your 
uh, discussion board posts and your journal entries. Thank you. Bye-bye.